Hello, my name is Chris Briley and I'd like to briefly walk you through the research that I would have presented at the EGU 2020 meeting in Vienna. So this is a paper that uh, we as a community have submitted uh, that describes a whole new batch of multimodal simulations for the mid-Holocene. You can go and see the preprint of the paper. Uh, it's submitted to the special issue of Climate of the Past. I'll just briefly outline what the Mid-Holocene is. I guess if you're watching this, you probably have some idea. But so uh, the Holocene is the past 11,000 years. The Mid-Holocene is the is taken to be 6,000 years ago, uh, which originally was thought of as the Holocene climate optimum, so the warmest temperatures in the Holocene. There's a little bit of discussion about whether that's still valid, but nonetheless, uh, from a modelling point of view, we've kept this same simulation since uh, the 90s now, and so we can allow some benchmarking between the different generations of the model. So here we're, we're maintaining it to be 6,000 years ago. The main change then was a change in orbital parameters, uh, with the precession changing, there was a slight reduction in the uh, in the carbon dioxide level that you can see it here. Uh, this was pre-industrial, and then it was slightly reduced, so about 20 parts per million of carbon dioxide. And for the first time, we're using a piece of software called Paleo Adjust to uh, not just change the orbital uh, incoming solar radiation, but also change precisely uh, when the output data refers to the months. It doesn't net, it doesn't really make a big difference to any of the stories that I'm describing here, but uh, it's something rigorous that we've done for the first time in this manuscript. So, uh, having said that about the the sort of the experimental design, when we submitted the paper uh, in December, there were uh, 16 models that have been used. They're listed here to remind me that there are models. Uh, additionally, the MPI, uh, NOI SM2, and uh, ECR3 uh, low resolution version have been uh, computed since, and so they'll be included in the revisions that I'm working on at the moment. And, uh, and so all of these models have done what is hoped to be the same experiment, although as you can see over here, there is some there is going to be some slight variations in it, but I suspect those really will be quite slight. The main change in climate uh, is the change in the orbital or the, the orbital configuration, and therefore the ins incoming insulation. That results in a change in the seasonal temperature distribution. And so when you have more incoming solar in the summer in the northern hemisphere, then that leads to a warming of the northern hemisphere summer of approaching about a degree. What I'm showing here is the ensemble mean of all of those different models, uh, both in summer or northern hemisphere summer over here, northern hemisphere winter. You can see that the, in the northern hemisphere, it generally cools right the way through uh, the winter and then you see the warming in the in the northern hemisphere summer in the uh, and, and there's a bit of cooling in the southern hemisphere in general the ocean is cooling throughout the year uh, which is partly related to the reduced carbon dioxide concentrations specified in this simulation which is something that that that's specified in this simulation but hasn't been specified in previous simulations, uh, previous simulations have just kept the pre-industrial level rather than inputting the observed uh, concentrations. As you alter with the strength of the seasonal cycle, that obviously alters the rainfall responses as well. And so in this map, in this ensemble mean map, you can see a response to that pattern which there's an increase in rainfall over in uh, North Africa. So that's sort of that increasing that, that summer monsoon there. And, uh, and correspondingly, there's a decreased rainfall 
in the southern hemisphere monsoons uh, and so that changes the, the structure of the seasonal cycle there's quite a robust and strong signal up here uh, in the east asian in, in the sort of the indian monsoon and a little bit of an east asian monsoon signal although that is a bit more uh, a bit less consistent and a bit less strong in this one there's some changes that are occurring over the ocean that are different than the changes that are occurring over the land in the precipitation uh, we've gone a bit farther than just looking at that as as rainfall changes to actually look at uh, definitions of the monsoon and so here this is the the monsoon domain the monsoon is where it's where the summer is the or the, the local summer is wetter than the local winter and and that the summer and that there's a substantial amount of rain occurring in the summer and that substantial amount of rain is taken as being two and a half uh, millimeters per day on average over a long summer season so a uh, five month long summer season and what you can see is that fundamentally the monsoons stay pretty much in the same place uh, across the globe but there is some slight variations in their location this is looking at that same information but just showing you some values for each of the different models and so for north africa up here and north africa being this first one then what you can see is that nearly all of the models in the new ensemble well all of the models in the new ensemble uh, have an increased rainfall rate of about 10 percent and an expansion of the monsoon of about 30 percent so the area of the monsoon uh, this is somewhat similar to the previous generation which is shown in squares here uh, there's some consistency on the east asian monsoon uh, but some of the other monsoons really the models don't necessarily agree especially over north america where models can be of either sign And then I want to move on to saying a little bit about how comparing that to the data. We've done a data analysis in this paper or a data model comparison in this paper that is uh, very, very large scale and isn't really thinking about processes, although it would clearly be much better to think about processes. And uh, at this level, we're not using any of the isotope enabled components of the models. Not all the models are isotope enabled, so that would cut down the ensemble dramatically. So we're not doing that. Uh, but so this is showing some large scale regions, each of the different circles. Uh, they're, they're most distinguishable up here is a different climate model. And these little blue ones are the previous generation. And then we've got the Arctic, the Antarctic, and then in 30 degree latitude zones. Uh, this bar here is from the Bart line pollen reconstruction and then this bit is from uh, the temp 12k reconstruction these uh, these temp 12k has only just been published I expect it will vary a little bit but the broad good story that the that the the, the temperature proxies suggest a warmer world whilst the models are suggesting a colder tropics uh, and, and in fact this generation of models is suggesting an even colder tropics than the previous one because of this more realistic uh, lower co2 concentrations so this figure is showing a regional change in precipitation and trying to compare it with uh, the particular models and the observations. So uh, the the box and whisker plots come from the Bart line et al analysis, and what you can see is that the the first few boxes, so northern Europe, central Europe, the Mediterranean, the Sahara region, um, it's probably more really thinking of the Sahel, and so is equivalent to that uh, North African monsoon 
that I showed earlier, and then East Asia, e, e, the East in North America, and then a region in Central Asia defined by Bart Line 2017. And what you can see in in these is that the is that the models are generally suggesting quite small changes compared to at least the spread in the data. Uh, we're not really comparing like for like here. This is the unsot. This is the area average in the models because we can compute that compared to the average of all the different uh, individual reconstructions. But what is clear in this is that over the Sahara region uh, in the middle in this plot, that the, imp the, the changes implied by the precipitation are a fair bit larger than the changes implied uh, or s shown in the simulations. Uh, and so the simulations, although they're getting an expansion of the North African monsoon and, an, and it, that, that North African monsoon is wetter, in fact, the movement to the mid-Holocene is probably just just about sufficient to remove the bias or to, to remove the bias in the pre-industrial compared to the observations. We're not really moving into the new state of the mid-Holocene. And so this this underestimate of the of the movement of the North African monsoon is existing in this generation, this PMIT four generation of models. It existed in the PMIT three generation as well. So just to give you a brief summary uh, of what is presented in this preprint, and I hope it will soon be an actual paper, is that there are is that at the mid Holocene there's a change in insulation forcing that alters the seasonal cycle and and the models consistently get a story that is showing a strong seasonal response to that, as one would expect. Uh, in broad scale, those patterns in these new generation of models is very similar to the, the models of the, the broad scale pattern of the previous generation of models, implying that the previous generation of models was was probably giving you the, a, a realistic answer. Uh, there are elements of the system where there were some biases. Those biases have been identified in the previous models and they've not been rectified in this newest generation. Uh, I've not shown anything here, but it does show in the paper that the, that the AMOC, we did briefly look at the AMOC and there seems to be very little consistent change in the AMOC, although that does require more work to really understand why. This piece of research is really just the very first introduction to this ensemble. Uh, and I would love for people to take it up and to do, take up the ensemble and do some, much more research upon it. I think we've got an open question as to why the models are showing a cooler mid Holocene. I understand that this is partly related to uh, greenhouse gases or the reduced slight reduction in greenhouse gases. But, but that's not what the data compilation suggests. And so finding some explanation for that, uh, how those two things could be consistent with each other is quite interesting. Uh, this generation, CMIP6, generally has higher climate sensitivity. Uh, we did briefly look at climate sensitivity in the paper. Uh, and we present values for all of the models climate sensitivity, but understanding quite what that means and how you can use the mid-Holocene to, to understand something about the future climate changes really, I think, requires more detailed analysis with this ensemble. There are obviously some region analysis. We've just done stuff at a global scale and not really looked into it. Uh, the ocean circulation and ecosystem and carbon cycle changes are obviously really quite important. And, and I would say we've not even really scratched the surface. We've said that there is a surface. We haven't gone into explaining why or what's happening with any of that. Uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, we've not done anything about the isotopes, uh, although there, will, there are isotope enabled models and that and I hope that that will provide a more useful form of data model comparison.
So there's the preprint of the paper that's on climate of the past uh, in a and the discussion phase is finished, but you can at least look at the preprint there. Uh, my email address is, is Chris Briley. All of the data, or nearly all the data from this is on the Earth System Grid Federation. The bits that aren't are going to be on the Earth System Grid Federation. Uh, I've done some post-processing through using the Climate Variability Diagnostics Package that provides lots of uh, metrics for this. And so it's also, I've used this same package for part of uh, Joe Brown's paper looking at ENSO. All of that data is sitting on, on the past to future.org website where you can go just go and download it. And if you need, and that, that's all done on the native model grids. If you need something that's a bit more post-processed or regridded, send me an email and I'm quite happy to, to share what I've got. So please do reach out to me and try and try and get involved.